Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, decoding binary BCS codes next. That is our next uh, big topic. Okay, so I'll only give a brief uh, introduction to this and show you some examples and maybe maybe do some quick uh, working to show you the general method. The exact proofs and all that sometimes will be missing, sometimes it's not too critical. Uh, wherever it's needed, I'll give you some details. Okay. All right. So, 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 so hopefully, so far the construction of uh, binary BCH codes is clear enough to you. Okay. So let me repeat that once again, just to set the stage for this. Okay. So usually we think of T error correcting. Binary BCH code of length n. Okay, so this is this is something we've been talking about. What do I mean when I say that? Okay, so it means the length is n and n is usually odd. Okay, so that's one thing I did not emphasize that clearly n has to be odd. Why, why should n be odd? Sorry? Uh, well, usually we pick n to be odd in this case because, see, we, remember we need an element beta in g of 2 power 1 for step 1. Okay, actually n odd is not really needed, so let, let, me, let me just skip that. So n is not odd. What I mean is uh, n is n plays a role in the construction. Okay, so let me, let me take that back. n is odd for some other reason. I don't know why I said that. Okay, so let me take that back. n may not be odd or even. So what do we need? We have a we need a beta n g of 2 power m and how does n, n enter the picture? We need order of beta to be greater than or equal to n. Okay. So usually if you want order to be equal to n, then n will have to be odd. Okay, so that's what that's what that's the correct statement that I should have made. Okay, so I'm sorry for that. Okay, so hopefully you can understand that. So if you want order of beta to be equal to n, then n will have to be odd. But if you just say order of beta is greater than or equal to n, n can be anything, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that, that's, our, that's our understanding. So n, n plays a role in that way in the design. Okay, so it does not have a direct role, but it plays a role in picking beta. Okay, so once you do that, how does t enter the picture? Okay, t enters the picture in terms of the zeros of the code. Okay, what are the zeros of the code? Beta, beta square all the way to what? Beta to d minus 1, but what is my d? D is 2t plus 1. Okay, so you go all the way to beta to 2t. Okay, the zeros are beta to beta to 2t. Okay, so what does that mean? This means that your generator polynomial, okay, remember the crucial, uh, crucial entity here was a generator polynomial and it played a played lots of useful roles. Okay, g of x is what? The LCM of minimal polynomial of beta, minimal polynomial of beta squared, all the way to what? Minimal polynomial of beta by 2 t of x. Okay, one very easy simplification you can do is to get rid of all the even powers of beta and this. Okay, so that's something that I've been talking about. You can simply write it as m beta, m beta by 3 of x, all the way to what? m beta power. 2t minus 1x. Okay, so that's good enough. You know that everything else it clearly has some other conjugate which is in which is already included in this list, and this is good enough. So this gives you t different minimal polynomials, and assuming that the I mean not assuming, knowing that the maximum degree of each of these things is m, the degree of g of x is clearly less than or equal to m times t. Okay, and we saw that g of x plays a crucial role. The code itself is equal to what? So the word m of x times g of x. Such that degree is less than or equal to n minus 1. Okay, so clearly from this description, you see that n minus k equals degree of g of x. Okay, so this is a crucial, crucial result. Okay, that controls everything. Okay, and going back to this LCM formula, you see that degree of g of x is smaller than or equal to m times t, which implies k is greater than or equal to n minus m t. Okay. So if you want to compute the dimension exactly, you have to list out 
all the conjugates of beta to beta part 2t identify these minimal polynomials figure out how many repetitions are there what they are what are not repeated and you multiply all of them together find their degrees add up all the degree you find the degree of gfi is exactly and from there you get the k exact but in case if you are not interested in the exact k you just want a quick estimate k is greater than or equal to n minus mt and i said something about this this thing is tight for uh, t small t when i say small t compared to what compared to n okay so t t small compared to n okay in relation to n if t is very small then it is it's mostly tight okay so k equals n minus all right so this part is clear right so 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 the zeros the zeros of the code play a lot of useful role okay so since we have this formula it, it it's clear that if i say csx is a code word okay this is only if what okay h times c transpose zero or go by row you can go through and write but cf beta has to be what zero cf beta square has to be zero so on to cf beta power 2t has to be equal to zero okay so this is if and only if so every code word polynomial has beta to beta part 2t as roots okay roots but the roots are over gf2 par n even though the polynomial is binary the roots are over gf2 par n okay so that's the trick in the definition so clearly all 2t conditions are not needed here right all the even conditions can be dropped and you can only keep the odd condition because you know the code word is binary okay that's very important if you did not know the code word is binary you can't drop the odd credit or odd uh, the even things all right so this is the general description hopefully this is clear okay we also saw some simple encoders we saw systematic encoders how to how to, how to achieve systematic encoding and all the rest so now we are going to see decode okay i'm going to start by looking at decoding with a very simple example and we'll see the ideas there and then we'll extend to the more generic case and the ideas are very similar but it's it's, it's interesting okay any questions at this point we're okay all right so before we start looking at the decoding let's just let's try to see how complex the decoding can be okay so i've been saying the decoding is not very easy so initially when we saw some examples we we saw some we saw the decoding for small numbers doesn't seem all that difficult but in general decoding can be more complicated so i, I want to convey that a little bit first before we dig dig into the decode okay so first let's see let's see what happens to simple decoding so if we try simple decoding happens so the syndrome decoding the main idea is the 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 syndrome table right right so you will have some syndromes how many such syndromes will you have you will have two power n minus k of one okay. if you want to do binary syndrome decoding you will have two power n minus k of them okay first of all if n is say so one of the examples i took was what uh, n minus k equals 120 or something you remember t equals 10 10 are the correcting code over of length 4095 right n minus k was 120 so so that itself begins to become scary right so 2 power 120 there's no way you can remember the table okay another way to think about why it has to be so complex is if you have a t error correcting curve okay definitely the ecaps that you have to put here have to include all the binary vectors of length n of weight less than or equal to t how many such things are there Numbers greater than equal to one plus n choose one plus n choose two all the way to what n choose t. Okay, so this this thing grows very fast with t and n. So roughly, if you think about it, this will grow as fast as n part t or something. Okay, in terms of polynomials, if you want to go really large n and large t, there is a useful approximation. You can approximate it as two power n times some function which is usually referred to as h two of p by n. Okay, so this is a very good approximation for this. Okay, so if if at all you want to have t and n, t by n being constant, okay, so t growing linearly with n, that's it's very large, it's not going to happen. But even if t is growing logarithmically, this fraction t by n might be reasonably large, and this function will be large there, and this is growing roughly, I mean, almost exponential. Okay, so it's actually not exponential. N part t is the largest thing. Depending on how t grows with n, it can become exponential. That's the point that I'm making. Here, okay, so the point is. The syndrome decoding is not going to work directly, okay? Because anytime you want to go to even as large a t as 10, 
and you want you have a block length of 1495, it's, it's gone, right? It's, it's gone to 2 power 120 or something, which you cannot do anything about. Okay, so syndrome decoding is not practical for even bad width and empty. Is that clear? Okay, that's the first thing you have to convince yourself about. Okay, if you're not convinced about this, all this fancy decoding I mentioned will not be really motivated. Okay, but you can see why this is hard. If you, if you don't believe me, you can try it. You can go take the 3095 code with t equals 10 and try to build a simple table for it, you will not succeed. It's, it's, it's going to be very hard. No, no computer can give you that. Okay. So, that this is ruled out. Okay. So, we need a smarter method. Okay. And the smarter method basically involves computations in GF2 para. Okay. So, as it is, we had a parity check matrix over GF2 para. Why do you want to go back to a binary syndrome decode? Why can't we do decoding in GF2 para? Okay. So, that is the first idea. You compute syndromes in GF2 param. Okay. And then try to use those syndromes and do some uh, intelligent solution. Okay, so that's the first idea in simplifying the decode. Okay, so you want to compute syndromes in GF2 para. Okay, and the second idea, which is also equally important, is the following. So let me let me state the two ideas. So, so simplifications. The first one is decoding in GF2 param. Okay, this is a bit of an annoyance because M can become fairly large and doing computations in Galois fields will involve some big tables and it may not be the cheapest thing that you can do but anyway today's VLSI is so powerful that you don't have to worry about all these things it's not a big deal but anyway so you can do decoding in GF2 param okay that is the first idea which simplifies the decoding and the next one is something known as we will not do ML decoding we will give up on maximum likelihood decoding okay so what is maximum likelihood decoding given any code received word you have to find the closest possible code word and here we have clearly seen if you want to do syndrome decoding or if you want to do full blown that uh, minimum distance decoding, just the description from the square point of view, for instance, it's going to be hopelessly complex. First of all, there are two power some 3000 code words in, in general case, and you can't just really go and uh, find the closest code word that easily. And if you want to do syndrome, syndromes are also too many, 2 power 120. Okay, so it becomes very large. So we will give up on maximum likelihood decoding. We cannot do maximum likelihood decoding. We will settle for what's known as bounded distance decoding. Okay, so this is a crucial idea for it's uh, a lot of simplification. What is bounded distance decoding? If weight of the other vector is less than or equal to t, decoding will succeed. Okay, else there are no guarantees. Anything can happen. I will not talk about what happens if the, the number of errors is greater than t. Okay, remember in syndrome decoding or ML decoding, what am I guaranteeing? Whatever the error vector is, I will find the closest possible code word. Okay, but as the numbers become large, as N and K become very large, both these methods are not very easy to do. In fact, people have shown some general hardness results on ML decoding saying that it is very, very hard to solve these things. It will take a lot of, lot of effort, too much effort to solve these things. Okay, so what people do is, they say, I will come down a little bit. If I know that the, the error vector is, if I know or if it happens that the error vector is, has weight within the error correcting capability, then I will guarantee that I will correct. If it has gone beyond the error correcting capability, I will not even try to find the closest possible code word. I will simply throw up my hands and say, I give up. Okay, so I am allowed to do. Okay, so that is the uh, difference between these and this. So not only will you make, will you decode a fail. Uh, because of an error, actual error, the error vector pushing you from the code word to some other code word, it, it can also fail because you have given up. You have given up on the computation point of view. You are saying, okay, I can't do beyond this, I just give okay. So, both these things will happen in this bounded distance decoding. Okay. But bounded distance decoding, the distance decoding is what makes BCH codes very, very practical. Okay. Up to even up to t equals 10, you can happily implement bounded distance decoding. And that's good enough. You can correct 10 errors, and that's a lot of errors that you're correcting. With, with very less complexity, you can correct. All right. Any questions on this? This is kind of a strange idea. If you're not used to it, I can give you a very simple example. So let me give you a very simple example to illustrate bounded distance decoding with small n and all that. Not with very big n. So very small n, I'll, I'll illustrate what I mean. Okay. So you'll see. You'll see what I mean. So here's an example. Okay, if you have a parity check matrix, it looks like this. Okay, this looks Let's say this is my parity check matrix. So suppose I want to build a syndrome for it, syndrome table for it. Okay, I can go ahead and do this. This is not very hard. I can build a syndrome 
how many syndromes will there be? Eight different syndromes. Right? So eight different syndromes start from zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero. So one zero zero one zero one. Okay, so it's getting a little bit smaller, but hopefully one one zero one one. Okay, there are eight different syndromes. Then what are the ECAPs? Okay, so six zeros, and then what do you do for zero zero one? Zero one zero zero one zero 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 zero. Zero one one zero 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 one zero one zero zero one zero 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 zero. Then one zero one is what? Zero 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 one and one one zero is zero zero zero. Okay, so this is kind of a trivial example. Don't don't uh, beat me up. So what is the last one? One one one. What do you do for that? You have to pick a weight two e cap, right? What is the weight two e cap you can pick? Let's say one zero 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 one zero, right? That's fine, right? So this is the way I do it. Remember, b equals three, which implies t is what one, right? So what? So so this is a maximum likelihood decoder. Whatever error vector is introduced, you define the closest possible code word. Okay? So if you notice, what is the error correcting capability of this code? Only one error can be corrected. What is the ML decoder doing? It is correcting the weight zero error, which is trivial. Anybody can do that. It's correcting all the weight one errors, six of them. And it is also correcting a weight two error, okay, which is this case. Okay, this is a weight two error, which the ML decoder is able to correct. If I were to implement a bounded distance decoding for this code, what would I do? If the syndrome is one one one, what will I do? I will give up. Okay, so in this case, it's too trivial to give up. You know, it's very easy to quickly compute it, but In the bounded distance decoder, technically, the syndrome is one one one. I will just give up, saying there is well, it's outside of my error correcting capability. So I won't. Okay. So the decoder can fail even if the syndrome becomes one one one. Okay. Well, the maximum likelihood decoder will always give you some answer. It will give you the closest code. Okay. In some sense. All right. So the bounded distance decoder is clearly not optimal, but it has slightly better computational gain than. ML decoding in this case, but in the general case, it has a huge computation gain. So it's polynomial time bounded distance decoding, usually polynomial time. Okay, so it's, it's very it's a huge gain compared to ML decoding. All right, so if you go to larger numbers, this will become more clear. I mean, this is a very trivial example, so it's very easy to see. But in general, it, it can become much more. All right, so these are the two important uh, things we will decode in GFP param, and we will stick to bounded bounded distance decoding. In a way, we will say. I will assume that the weight of the error vector is less than or equal to t, and proceed with my decoding. In case something happens, my decoder will give up. If the actual weight for error was greater than t, I will give up. And from there, the decoder will fail. I don't care. All right? Okay. So let's begin with an example, and uh, example of decoding. And it's the idea is here. I have some code, but nevertheless, uh, sometimes it's interesting. Okay. So for example, I'm going to take n equals 15. Okay. And data to be Primitive element of zero sixteen. Okay, now take t to be equal to two. Okay, so remember this is the first non-trivial case that we are seeing. Two error correcting in a code. Okay, so, so far we have never seen a two error correcting code. One error correcting is usually very trivial. Why is one error correcting very trivial? You can do it. I mean, mostly it's the Hamming code, right? Hamming code or something similar to it, and you can do the syndrome decode. So only correcting one error. How many syndromes are there? N plus one, right? And this n plus one is very small. You can make a syndrome table and then correct it. Okay, so correcting one error is very very easy. And when you go to correct two errors, how many syndromes are there? One plus n choose one plus n choose two. So immediately you're going to the n square range. Okay, so when you go to the n square range, what is wrong? I mean, think about implementing the decoder, right? So bits are coming at a constant rate. You want to roughly be able to send out one bit for every bit you receive. Okay, so every time your, your bits are getting clocked in into your decoder at some rate, you want to be able to roughly send in linear time. Everything should go out, right? As a matter, multiple of n. If you have an n square complexity thing sitting in there, you start accumulating so many bits, and you have to stop once in a while, stop once in a while. It just will not work continuously smoothly. Okay, so n square is very bad in general. Okay, so you want at least n log n, and log n can be managed, but at least n. Okay, if it is n, it is great. Okay, so usually it's what you want. Okay, so you don't want more complexity than 
some big scale up multiple of n okay so from 10 n 20 n 100 n you can deal with n log n is okay it's not very bad but once you go to n squared you will start accumulating so much by the time you can finish it off and send it out you can't process it okay so n squared is usually very bad so people will do crazy things to avoid n squared okay so here is the first situation that if i were to do a syndrome decoding for bounded distance decoding i will need a table with n square entries okay so let's see if we can do something else okay so that's what we're going to see okay so let me do the setup uh, once again i have a message m okay what will be the k and all for this let's, let's do a quick computation okay t is 2 means 0 for what theta theta square d pata 3 and d pata 4 right up to 2t okay so clearly from here you see that g of x is basically minimal polynomial of beta times minimal polynomial of beta pata 3 and what do we know the degree will be it will be 8 right so for beta it's x pata 4 plus x plus 1 and then for beta pata 3 it will be x pata 4 plus x pata 3 plus x pata 3 plus x plus 1 so it's going to be 8 so k is going to be 7 okay. so these are some just things that are not so important so we got k fixed here, you do an encoding, let's say you do a systematic encoding and you produce a code word C. So remember, I've been writing vectors, I'll also think of those code words as polynomials. Okay, so both of them are equivalent for me. Okay, so remember what is the equivalence? So I have a code word C0, C1, C14, I'll think of the polynomial as C0 plus C1x plus C14 x plus 14. Okay, and what do I know about every code word? It has four roots, which are beta, beta square, beta power 3, and beta power 4. Okay, so both I know, but I mean essentially these two are the only things which are important, right? The other two are guaranteed. Okay, so see now it goes through a channel. Remember how did we model the channel? Channel basically adds a error vector. Now the error vector also I can think of as a polynomial. Okay, so that's also very common. Okay, and you will get progressive vector R, which is part of a polynomial. Okay, remember this is equivalent to a polynomial. Okay, again binary. Now you have an RFX. Alright. So you have a received polynomial or a received vector and you have to process it. Okay, the first step is definitely a syndrome computation, but I don't want to compute syndrome in binary. Okay, I don't want a seven bit, I mean eight bit syndrome and deal with it. I want a syndrome in GF sixteen. Okay. Essentially I'll also have an eight bit species syndrome even in GF sixteen, but I will think of the syndrome as a GF sixteen element as opposed to a binary 8 bit vector. Okay, I will show you what it is. Okay. So what are the two syndromes that I will compute? The two syndromes I will compute are as follows. Okay. So syndrome, I will compute S1 as R of beta and S3 as R of beta power 3. Okay. So I think hopefully you can see that very clear uh, reasonably but this is the syndrome. Okay. So, so what do you mean by syndrome? So let me let me once again write it down. S1 is R of beta. What is R of x? C of x plus E of x. So what will happen if you put C of beta? I'll get zero. So only thing that will be left is E of beta. Is that clear? So when I do R of beta, of course I, I don't know E. I can't evaluate E of beta from knowing E, but I know R. Okay, I can evaluate R of beta. I evaluate R of beta, but I know that that is that answer is the same as E of beta. So I know this is my symbol. Okay, and that what is the next symbol? S3, which is R of beta part 3, which I know is also equal to E of beta part 3. Is that okay? So I think my 3 is quite bad. So I have to write it more clearly. <laughs> it's a bit ugly, but it's more clear. Is that okay? So we have two syndromes. Remember, each of these syndromes are elements of GF. 16, which means for representing each syndrome, how many bits do I need? 4 bits. So, 2 syndromes together anyway are 8 bits. Okay, so they, don't, they don't reduce your syndrome length by any chance, any, any, any measure of imagination. You still need those 8 bits for physically representing them. But, how do you think of it abstractly? Each element is an element of, each syndrome element is from GF16. Okay, as opposed to thinking of it as 8 bits, I will think of 4 bits together as an element of GF16. Okay, so, that is a that is a new thing in this uh, idea. Is it okay? Alright. So now the question is given S1 and S3, I have to find E of X. If I find E of X, I'm done. Right? Is that clear? So if, if in general you ask the problem uh, ask this question, you will go back to your same old syndrome decoder, you can't do much. 
Okay. How do we avoid it? How do we proceed further? So we assume the bounded distance condition. Okay. So to proceed further, we assume bounded distance. We will say that the weight of E is less than or equal to 2. E is 2 in this case. So we will assume it is less than or equal to 2. Okay. So that is the next step that we assume here. We assume weight of E is less than or equal to 2. Okay. So this is the bounded distance condition. So once you do that, E of x is at what form? E of x is x star i plus x star. Let's suppose for some. Okay. So so we will suppose E of x is of this form. Okay. So so there is one condition here which is a bit weird. As in, for instance, if I say less than equal to two, the weight could have been one. Okay, so if I write it like this, it does not assume the weight uh, equal to 1, but let us say we will assume x bar i plus x bar j. Okay, you see the weight equal to 1 can also be handled later. Okay, so I will assume basically weight of E is equal to 2, which is the worst case. Okay, so I am going to assume that and then try and do my decoding and in the best case, it will see that it will, it will come out better. Okay, so we can adjust for it later on. So let us assume weight of E is equal to 2, so that E of x becomes x bar i plus x bar j. Is that clear? This is clear, right? So I can write it like this. So in the EFX is in the polynomial form. In the vector form, what will I have? 0, 0, 0, in the ith place it will be 1, and then the jth place also it will be 1, the stall will be 0. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we will deal with the weight 1 errors also. I am not saying we won't deal with it. It is easier, much easier to deal with the weight 1, weight one errors. We will come to it later. So we will first assume the weight 2 errors okay, and we will see how to do them. And then we will do the weight 1 errors. Weight 1 errors are much easier. In fact, it will be a special case of this one. We'll see. Okay. All right. So now, what happened to my syndrome? What is S one? E of. Remember, I don't know I and G. Don't think I know I and G. I and G, I and J are what I have to find now. Once I find I and J, I am done, right? Yes. What is what is what do I know? I know this syndrome. Okay. I know if I put in x equals beta and e, what will I get? I will get S one. Okay. And that is remember this is R of beta. So now it will be beta power i plus beta power j. Okay. So of course I can also put x equals beta squared. Then what happens? Simply I will get s1 squared. Okay. So that will not be anything new that I can use. Okay. That will not give me anything. So that's why I am not using 2. Okay. You might wonder why I am not using 2. Not using 2 because it doesn't give me any new information which I can use. Okay. The next one is 3. Which is s3. Okay, remember these two I know. Okay, s1 and s3 I can compute. Um, s1 and s3 I can compute. Okay. This is beta power 3i plus beta power 3i. Okay. So from these two equations we have to find i and j. Right? Is that clear? So, for instance, let me just quickly immediately tell you how to deal with weight 1 errors. If the error of the weight of the error was actually 1, right, first of all, if weight of the error was 0, what will happen to S1 and S3? It will both be 0. Okay, so, that is one way in which you can quickly determine weight 0. What about weight 1? If there was only one bit error, what will be the relationship that satisfies between S1 and S3? S3 will be S1 part 3. So, you just check that. You check if S3 is S1 part 3. Raise S1 to the power 3, see if you get S3. If you get that, then you get out by saying there was only one error. Okay? Now, if it turns out that S3 is not S1 power 3, and both of them are not 0, then you have to assume 2 error and okay. So, that is why I said 0 error and 1 error are very easy cases which you can quickly deal with. Deal with. You will not worry about it. We will only look at the 2 error case. So, how do we solve this? This is not very hard. We have solved this before, right? Yes or no? Have you not solved it? Okay, so in the examples, I told you how to solve this kind of equation. So how do you solve it? You factor beta power three i plus beta power three j plus beta power i plus beta power j times beta i squared. So that's what you do. So let's let's take this guy, and then you see s three equals beta power i plus beta power j times beta power two i plus beta power i beta power j plus beta power two j. So okay, what is this guy now? S1, right? So from here you get what about these two guys together? 
F1 square. Okay, so you get immediately that beta by i times beta by z equals S3 by S1. What? Minus, but I guess minus is the same as plus plus S1 square. Okay. So, so for instance, okay, so there's one case immediately you'll see. I mean, if you're paying really good attention, you'll see. Only if S1 is not zero, I can do this. Okay. What happens if S1 is zero? And S3 is not 0. Can it happen? Okay. Under 2 error case, it cannot happen. But actually, if there are 3 errors, it can happen. Okay. Some crazy things like that can happen. So, that is the hint for me to say that I have to give up. Okay. If I see that S1 is 0, but S3 is not 0, then it means I have to give up. Okay. So, the number of errors has crossed the reasonable limit of t that I have put there, and I will give up. Okay, so, these are things that you can build into your decoder if you like, find out if you are going wrong here and there. But in general, if S1 is non zero, S3 is non zero, you can do this. Okay? So, what do you know now? I know beta i plus beta j, I know beta per i times beta per j. What do I get out of this? I get a quadratic equation. So, what is the quadratic equation that I get? Even if you write it down, I will get what? Say some uh, y squared, right? What is the equation? Plus S1 y plus S3 by S1 plus S1 squared equals 0. Okay, so what will happen if I solve this? To get theta par i and theta par j. So suppose the roots are, let me, let me write it, let me write it more carefully and get roots y0 and y1. Okay, so I get a quadratic equation. How do you solve a quadratic equation? The formula won't work, right? How will you solve it? Sorry, you can't do that complete square formula. The formula comes from completing squares. But two is, two is equal to zero in this. You can't do it. So what do we do? Let's try another way to substitute. Why are you substituting? Not too bad. Remember, your n and two par m are going to be close. Okay, so, it will at most be doing n operations and it is not n squared. Okay. So, as long as anything is n squared, you are okay. When you go to n squared, problem comes. Okay. So, it is only n as many as n steps. In fact, you will do only n operations. Forget about 2 param. You will do only n, n operations. So, it is very easy to do that. Is it okay? So, you solve for it and find roots y0 and y1. Okay. If it turns out that you have two distinct roots y0 and y1, then you can declare that you have found the two way error. But if you follow this procedure and finally you find that there are repeated roots or some other crazy situation, what does it mean? Somewhere you went wrong. Okay, there was there was more than two errors. Something crazy happened, more than two errors occurred and it didn't work out. Okay. So so that's why boundary distance decoding proceeds with the assumption that let's say two errors happen. And if anything exceptional occurs, something is wrong and I'll give up. Okay. So this is the idea. So let me repeat once again what you do. Find the syndrome, write the syndrome in terms of beta par i beta par j and the point is from these equations you are trying to solve for beta par i and beta par j. How do you do that? From the syndrome equations you go to a polynomial equation. Okay, y square plus s1 y plus s3 by s1 plus s1 square equal to 0 which is a quadratic equation. How do I solve it? Exhaustively try everything. I solve it. I get two roots y0 and y1. Okay. If y0 and y1, if y0 not equal to y1, okay, then declare. Okay, first of all, I may not even get two roots. Okay, so remember these are all finite fields. This is some equation. Sometimes I may not get two roots. I may not get any root. It may be an irreducible polynomial. Who knows? Okay. So in all those cases, you declare that something went wrong. I give up. Okay. If you find that y zero not equal to y one, then you declare. Uh, declare what? Okay. So declare. So you have to write now y zero and y one in the power notation, right? So you have to write uh, y zero equals theta power i and y1 equals t par par g. Okay, remember y0 and y1 are elements of gf2 par n. Okay, so that is also another thing I forgot. You get roots y0 and y1 in gf16. It is very important that you look for only in gf16. Okay, if you cannot find two roots in gf16 or if you cannot find two distinct roots in gf16, something went wrong in your decoding. Okay, something, something is wrong beyond our assumptions. So, we give up. Okay, if nothing else like that happened, you found two distinct roots and they are not equal. Then you declare that the first root was the beta par i, second root is the beta par j. How do you find the i and j? 
you have to look it up in the table. Okay, so in fact, if you assume that the table is already given, already y0 and y1, you will get as powers of beta already. Direct. You just go and find the corresponding power of beta. So it gives you i and j. You go to the location i, location j, flip those two things. Okay. <coughs> okay, and finally, for the book set, i and j. Right? And that gives you the decoder. Is okay? Okay, so nowhere we, we had to do some n square kind of operation. Everything was just linear. Okay, so so that's that's the nice uh, nice thing about uh, linear and n methods. Okay, so that's the nice thing about nice thing about. Okay, is this clear? I think there are a lot of examples that one can come up with, but it's it's not going to be that illustrative. So I'm not I'm not going to give you an explicit example. I think in your tutorials. There will be some examples where you can work out and see how this thing work happens. Okay, and you can also try. It's very easy to try. Take take the GF sixteen T equals two code. Add some four errors, some random four errors, and try this process. You'll see something will fail. Okay, so you can quickly write this in MATLAB. It's not a very hard program. Decoder to write. You'll see something will keep fail. Okay, so this is the essence of the BCS decoding idea. For T equals two, for T equals two, it's usually very simple. One can write it down very easily. The simplification is very trivial, and it can. Okay, any questions? Anything disturbing you about this? Perfectly happy. But like I said, at any point in time, if what you expect does not happen, you basically declare failure. Okay, you just give up. Say that something weird has happened. I'm not going to. Do it. Okay, so that in that way, it's very different from ML decoding. ML decoding, you have you don't have the choice. Right? So you have to find the closest code. Here, you yeah, we don't do such things. You just keep trying your algebraic method. And if it fails somewhere, you just give. Okay, so these decoders are also called algebraic. Okay, so why are they called algebraic? Oh, you can see why they are called algebraic. Okay, so basically, everything involves algebra. Okay, so you have some equations, you can solve them. Some unknown variables, you do some cancelling, you eliminate one equation from the other, you get some quadratic equation to solve it. So these are called algebraic decoders. Okay, any question? You have a question? What is the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'll come to it. Okay, so the point he's trying to make is you have just two equations here. You happily eliminated. What do you do if t is 10? Okay, so there is there is a method for it. I'll come to it. That's the next thing. Okay. So what I'm going to do next, if this is reasonably clear to you, is to point out the general t. Okay, in case t is general, some t, what do you do? Okay, so if this method will not be so So trivial, but we will use some standard identities. It's been done before. We we'll use some identities in some people. Okay. Do you have a question? No, 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 no. It's, it's only if there are two errors. Okay, you're saying if y zero, y one, and all. You're assuming only if uh, if there are two errors. There can be four errors, and in this process, you can get y zero equal to one. There are five errors, six errors. Okay, I mean, so many errors are possible, and crazy things can happen. So you are assuming two errors, you know, be two errors. Okay. So just to, I mean, to give you a rough idea, correcting beyond the error correcting capability of BCH codes is considered very, very hard. There are very few precious algorithms that are available out there. Let's see, you know, how hard is it to correct beyond T? I mean, there's a bunch of equations you can play around with it. It turns out it's very hard. I mean, it's not very easy to correct uh, errors beyond t. Okay, so you know, there are some methods. There are a lot of probabilistic methods. There are lots of algebraic, not lots of, there are very few algebraic methods. So one method which is quite quite successful. Maybe if we have some time, I'll try to talk talk about it. The algebra involved becomes quite intense. Okay, so once you go beyond t errors, that's the only problem. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do is. Get started with the setup of the algebraic decoder general. Yes, sir. How many errors we have? The quadratic equation depends on y zero and y one. See, the quadratic equation. Okay, so the question is, you always get a quadratic equation, but I'm saying you won't get a quadratic equation. See, if there are four errors, it will be beta per i one plus beta per i two plus beta per i three plus beta per i four, and s three will be beta per three i one plus three i two plus three i three plus three i four. No way you can eliminate all that. Right? You have only two equations. How will you eliminate? Here they were able to eliminate and get to a quadratic. In the general case, when you have more than two errors, you can't eliminate. 
So you have to rely on more fancy algebra. Which some of you may know, many of you may not know. Even when you do that, not many, very firm results are not available. Once you get lose your hold on this elimination thing, it just goes over. It's very difficult to. Do. Okay. Anything else? But it's a useful exercise. Think about. Think about it. There are some. There are some very nice uh, things to do. Right. Any other questions? It's okay. Okay. So let me start setting up the general decoder. Okay. So we're going to now look at uh, the general case. Okay. So once again, I'll assume P is correct. Thing. M of the lamp, beta and G of two are order greater than or equal to M. Then you have zero the standard uh, notation that you have beta beta squared all the way to beta power two t. These are the zeros, okay? And uh, the same setup as before. So the the picture is the same as before. So let me just quickly draw it. Have C of x, and then you have U of x. Have R of X. And then the first block is simple computation. Okay, so I'll compute three syndromes. S1 is R of beta. S3 is R of beta. Okay, so let me also include S2. Okay, so just for fun, not for fun, for simpl simplifying my notation, I'll include S2. I know S2 is just S1 squared. It's now no big deal, but I'll just include it. Let's go all the way to S2 T. Okay, because my my uh, algebraic simplification is just easier for it. There is a version without S2. There is a version that you can have with only S1, S3, and all. So if you're practically implementing it, you might worry about those things. But for theory, for development, we'll assume all the syndromes are available. Okay. So how do we process this? How do we algebraically process the syndrome? Is the question. So we'll do our uh, uh, assumption. Let's say weight of T is below W and W is below root. Okay, so this is our bounded distance assumption. So once you make that assumption, what is U of x? U of x is going to be x bar i1 plus x bar i2 plus x bar i2. X bar I2. Okay, and just like I mentioned before, you don't know W ahead of time. Okay, that's that is a valid complaint. I don't know W ahead of time. How do I know this equation? You don't know that. That's true. But finally, when our implementation comes, we will start by assuming W equals one. It sucks. If it fails, we'll go to W equals two. If it fails, we'll go to W equals three, etc. So, in a way, our algorithm, because of its iterative nature, will stop at the right W. Okay, don't worry about it. But for now, in the formulation, we'll assume W errors and go ahead and do it. In the implementation, we will start with W equals one, two, etc. Is it okay? So, this is the effect. So, what are the equations I have? My syndrome equations: S one equals theta bar i one plus theta bar i two plus so on to theta bar i two. Plus two is same thing squared, right? Two by two by one. Two by two by two. Two by two by two. And as three by one, two by two by two. 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 All the way down to let's say as three p. So two by two by two. Two by one. Two by two by two. Two by two. Way to be cut off. Is it okay? <coughs> These are my two D equations. Okay, and uh, what are my unknowns? Okay, this part is known clearly, right? Left hand side is known. What is not known? Unknown is W, I one, I two, so on till I W. Okay. So given these equations, I have to find. W and I1, I2, and I2. So W, I'm going to say is kind of hidden. Okay, so let's just not forget about W. Let's say W is known. Somebody gives you the W. So you have to find I1, I2 to I2. Okay. So in terms of equations, what type of equations are these? For instance, are these linear equations in the I1, I2, I2, W? Clearly not. Okay. So these are showing up in the powers. Okay. So they're not linear equations. So our goal, okay, as 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 always, the only things we can solve are what linear equations. So we'll try to go from here to Linear equations. So now you do that. We'll involve some fancy substitution. We'll make a really fancy substitution to go from here to the linear equation. Okay. So we'll see if you've not seen this trick before. It's a very very interesting trick. Okay. So you go from here to linear equations. How do you do that? Any ideas? How can you go from here to linear equations? 
log oh my god log but the problem is it's plus it's just product and there's no problem but it has plus log doesn't interact well with plus even if you assume the discrete log and the finite field etc so it doesn't interact very well with plus let me see no major interesting ideas anyway so since it's well known no point in asking you to repeat it do you have an idea go ahead This one part K. What is K now? Ah, and then see if you notice some patterns there. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean you can think of it that way. But in general, if you want to do it for an unknown T, you need to use some powerful ideas. Okay, so some there are some very powerful ideas about. So one property you'll notice: everything on the right-hand side has a definite form. What kind of a form is that? It's it's a power sum form, right? And it's also symmetric with respect to beta par i one. So you, you can just rotate them around, and you get the same equation. If you replace i two by i one, i three by i two, so in a way it's it's symmetric. In any permutation you do with the i two to i w, you get the same thing. So the right hand side I want to call symmetric polynomials. And symmetric polynomials have some powerful properties, and you end up using some properties of how to express symmetric polynomials in in the simulation. Even you can do it in general, and that's the idea that is used. It's something called Newton's identities. It relates symmetric polynomials. Of course, it goes back to Newton, which means been known for a long time. So, <coughs> so we use that. Okay. And how to use that? We we'll do it in two steps. In the first step, we'll make a very simple substitution. It doesn't mean much. I'll simply say x i sub j equals theta power i. So we do the substitution. So j equals one to the p. Okay. This is just a. This is no, no, no. There's no x i j. So we'll just say j. What's the point of doing? So instead of carrying this beta par i beta par i, I'll simply replace beta par i one by x one, beta par i two by x two. Uh, it's understood that these x's take values in g of two par m. Okay, so that's understood. I'm not not repeating that. So if I do that, what are the equations I have? X one equals x one plus x two plus x w. S two is x one square plus x two square plus x two. So I'm still x two p. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this is so. So what I have on the right hand side here are what are called power sums, and they are also symmetric polynomials. Okay. So symmetric polynomials are not uh, are, are well studied. It's an old uh, area. Okay. Can you give me examples of other symmetric polynomials that have come across? So the power sums are clearly symmetric. What do you mean by symmetric? You permute the variables x1 through xw in any order. The final polynomial you get is exactly the same. It doesn't change. Have you heard of other symmetric polynomials? Anything else that you come across? No. What about polynomials of this form? So, for instance, summation or all I J. Let's say. Okay. So let's say. Yeah. So let's put I less than J for instance. Okay. X I X J. Okay. What about I less than J less than K? X I X J X K. They all possible i j k. Okay, so why do these kind of polynomials show up? Sorry? Yeah. So the relationship between roots of a polynomial and the coefficients of a polynomial. Given the roots of the polynomial, if you want to write the coefficients of the polynomial, you will use polynomials like this. And these are also symmetric. Okay. For instance, the coefficient of the constant term is what? The product of all the roots. That's a symmetric polynomial. And then the uh, The, the largest degree term will be one. You normalize that way, and the next largest degree will be the sum of all those. That's again a symmetric polynomial. And the next one will be sum of all taken to other n. That's again a symmetric polynomial. Okay. So it turns out symmetric polynomials have some basis, and those those symmetric polynomials, the, uh, the coefficient symmetric polynomials, form a basis for all symmetric polynomials. So any set of symmetric polynomials can be written in terms of those polynomials. Okay. So the critical idea is to go from power sums to polynomial whose roots are x1 through x double. If you do that substitution, you will automatically get the coefficients of those polynomials as symmetric polynomials, and those can be written in, in linear form in, as in, as linear functions of these power sums. Okay, so that's the idea. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit of course long-winded. If you've not seen it before, it will seem surprising. 
So the crucial substitution you make is you come up with a polynomial for which the x1 through xw are the roots. Then take the coefficients of that polynomial and that and these s1s will have a linear relationship. Okay, and you can do this. Okay, so that's the high level idea. Okay, and uh, I'll let you think about it for a while. Go and read up something on symmetric polynomials if you're interested. Tomorrow I'll, I'll develop on this and give you the actual. Okay, so let's stop here.